Well, I can definitely say my heart's welded to yours. Um, get a chance to really just be able to spend time with all of you, and even on the field of battle, um, I feel completely privileged and honored and humbled uh, to call you my friends and my family. And I'm just very grateful to all of you for just being so kind to me and um, just just generous and, and, and opening up uh, the pulpit um, for me to be able to um, bring what the Lord has had on my heart for over a decade. Believe it or not, you know, it's like, you look at me, obviously you guys, the more you get to know me, you see more that I'm really not that special at all. And, and I'm not great. I'm just a normal guy who is broken by the Lord and that God in his mercy and rich grace uh, has allowed has allowed me to come into his kingdom and then even even more gracious that he allowed, he even uses me for his glory. Uh, he gets to, he, you know, he, he gives me the opportunity um, to go out into the world and preach the gospel. Um, so with that being said, I am overwhelmed with gratitude and, and extremely grateful and humbled to be here. Um, Pastor Eric and Miss Karen, thank you for having me here. I, I consider it a great honor, a great blessing. Thank you for taking care of me the way that you have and prayed for me, Lalo and, and Mike and Scott and all you guys and Josh and Jeremy and all of you guys that have been so kind to me, Jeff and all the all the all the men and, and, and that have also received me and allowed me to go out with you last night and preach with you. I I uh, really experienced um, just an, an uh, just a lot of encouragement out there seeing you guys just go after it. I mean, you guys are very violent and, and very aggressive uh, in seeing people come to the Lord in a very godly way. I mean, a very violently spiritually and godly and loving and very just a very combustible atmosphere here at this church. And I see, I really believe God is going to continue to do some very marvelous and great things through this body. And um, I'm very privileged at least to be here over the weekend and be to be able to celebrate a lot of what God is doing in your lives. And thank you for having me here. Well, let us turn to Psalm 86. Psalm 86. Psalm 86. Verse 11 and 12. Let us go ahead and read. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord, my God, with all my heart. And I will glorify thy name forevermore. Let us pray. Father, we just once again, Lord, as your word says in Psalms 4-4, four, 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 that stand in awe, stand in awe, Lord, and sin not. And Lord, I just thank you, Lord God, that our awe of you, our view of you is so great and so awesome. As Isaiah 6, is, as Isaiah 7, he saw the Lord yeah. high and lifted up. Lord, I pray today that we would come together and we'd see our Lord high and lifted up. Lord, I pray that we'd just be in awe of you today, that we'd fear you, Lord. Oh, God, that you would help us and enable us by your power and by your spirit. And allow us to rent our hearts, Lord. Help us to cry out to you. Help us, Lord God. We're a desperate people. We're a, we're a needy people. And I pray, Lord, that the Spirit of God would come today. And it would in, that, that he would invade our hearts and invade our lives and invade our minds and our emotions. Oh, Lord, that we would be gripped today in your grace. Lord, would you open our hearts, Lord, today just to, just to, to love you more. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. I just commit this time into your hands. I commit this message into your hands, Lord. I, I just call upon your name. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving me this opportunity to come here and, and worship you, yes. 
Lord, in the proclamation of your word, Lord. And I, I thank you for what you're doing in this congregation by raising up men and thrusting them out into this apostate world. Yes. Lord, that you're setting this family of God on fire with your truth, and they will not compromise. Oh, Lord, continue to use your people. Lord, continue to arm us from heaven to be able to go out into this world and succeed for you. Yes. Be glorified, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of this message today is titled, A Heart Set on Fire. A Heart Set on Fire. And this title, interestingly enough, was inspired by what is known as Calvin's Crest. The Crest of John Calvin. The motto that he went by, the, the emblem, the seal, and by which he wanted to be defined by. We all understand what a family heritage is. We all understand what our genealogies are. And, and a lot of times we too will uh, take the pains and go and search and find our own family crest and look at it. What does it mean? And, and it, it gets us excited. But Calvin had a a different thought in mind when he had his crest put together. And there is a, an enigma behind his crest because um, as much as I studied and looked for the origins, I don't find a lot of in how it all came together. But I do know that this was his seal. And when you look at this seal, uh, you look at this crest, you begin to really understand the man and his theology and what it is that he was trying to articulate and trying to communicate to the world. The crest of John Calvin represents a burning heart held in an extended hand with these words around it. And if you get a chance, I'd encourage you to look it up. It says, my heart, I give thee, Lord, without delay and with sincerity which captures the essence of our text Calvin's crest is a revelation that says the Reverend Bastian Kruthoff who authored the book I'm quoting from he says much of the misunderstanding about Calvin he says and about his system could be avoided and can be corrected if we begin where he began and that was with a burning heart because we can get all caught up in different nuances and argue about this and this point and this point which I believe are good arguments to have good discussions to have but if we look behind all of this what we find is a burning heart for God a man who has been redeemed by God and a man has been so radically transformed and changed by God that he can do nothing else but reach out with that burning heart to others. And that's what we see here behind his theology. Because we can become dried up. There's a lot of reformed people out there who, is, who are dry as can be. I've seen them. Then we have people out there, the Arminian camps, that, that their theology may not be like ours. And they're on fire. They're preaching the word of God. They're out there doing these things. But yet their theology isn't necessarily correct. So just because we have the greatest theology in the world, which we do, it's the truth. We've got to ask ourselves, do you herald that with a burning heart? Are you one of those today that say, yes, I am one of God's redeemed? Because if that is true, if you are redeemed, you should have a heart that is set on fire, not just to keep those doctrines to yourself, not to hold that theology just to yourself and in the house of God, but to take that theology, take that burning heart to the world around us. It's combustible. Jeremiah said it. He couldn't keep the fire contained in his bones. Even Paul said, necessity is laid upon me. That the urge was so great, he, if he held it in, he was going to...
combust and be set on fire. And this is, I believe, where we need to be. I'm not saying everybody needs to be shouting down everywhere they go, but I am saying that we need to have a heart set on fire by the Holy Spirit of God. The crest seemed to embody his entire theology. The heart in the crest was his heart. A heart that burned with the revelation of God in his word and by his spirit. Then there is the extended hand offering the heart to God. For Calvin, there was no divorce between Christian faith and application. There was no difference. He didn't see it in two different ways. There was never a question or an option. He had seen it as one faith. A, the a theology that isn't applied is bad theology. I don't care how good a theology that we may say it is. If it's not applied, if it's not acted upon, because theology in essence is designed what? For us, obviously, as a body of Christ to learn and to grow and to mature. And to worship our Lord, but it's also to take to the world around us. And Calvin uh, didn't see any divorce between the two. The cross not only captures the heart of Calvin, but in essence captures the heart of God. And the heart of every believer who has been transformed by the gospel's power. And that's where we are today. And my question for you, two questions I have for you today. The first question is this. Do you have a heart redeemed by God? Are you redeemed? Are you born again? Are you saved? Have you been made right with God? Have you been reconciled? Do you have a new heart? Have old things passed away and all things become new? Have you been planted in the death of Christ as God has planted you in the death of his son? Have you risen, as the scriptures say in Romans 6, to the newness? Have you tasted and seen that the Lord is good? Have you been born from above? Has the Lord transformed you and brought you out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light? Are you empowered by God's spirit? Have you died to self? Sin the world? Satan's pleased against you? Have you come to grips with who Christ is? And what he's done and completed on the cross. This is extremely important today. And if you have, have you offered that heart back to God? Have you taken that fiery heart that God has given you? Nothing we can conjure up from the flesh. Nothing that, that can come from us. But God gives his people new hearts. God says, I will give you a new heart. I will put my spirit within you. I will cause you to walk in my ways. I will cause you to love the things that I love. You're no longer a slave to sin. You're no more fascinated with the things of this world. Paul said, I am crucified unto the world and the world unto me. There's a cutting there. There's a death there. And I would ask you today if you've come to that point in your life, because many of us can call ourselves Christians. It's easy. Go to Fort Worth. Everybody's a Christian there. Had a gentleman standing in front of the movie theater like this for like 15 minutes. And I said, boy, I have to go up. And he had a track, and he was reading it. One of the tracks one of you gentlemen had given him. And I began to ask him a few things about his faith. I asked him, first I asked him, I said, um, I don't remember exactly the words I used, but it was something like, um, are you a Christian? And he says, yes, I am. And I said, how do you know? He says, well, I'm born again. I go, what does that mean? He goes, what do you mean? How do I feel about it? No, I'm saying, what does it mean to be born again? I want to hear your definition of what that means because that's going to determine whether or not I'm going to walk away or I'm going to continue to stand here and talk to you. And his, and his answer was, is that, well, I just serve God my own way. I do things my own way and God understands. I said, no, sir, God has one way. It's in the scripture. It's the word of God. It's the way, the truth, and the life. It's the only way. Unless you're going that way, sir, you're going the wrong way. And he got a little offended. And I said, sir, I realize I'm, I've invaded your space. I realize that it makes him a little bit obnoxious that I'm standing right in front of you blabbing. But you must realize I love you enough to tell you the truth. 
And you must come to the grips and reality of what God's word says about what it means to be born again against your word. Because God doesn't bless your way. God doesn't agree with you. You need to submit to God, repent of your sin, put your faith in Jesus Christ, and trust and obey his word. He shook my hand and walked off. But we've got to be, you know, we, we, we've got to be public and, and vocal with our faith. If not, how are other people going to hear? I believe when we're, we're talking about a heart set on fire, I do believe at some level, I'm not saying this is the extent uh, of, of what it means to have a heart set on fire with God. I think I just barely, barely scratched the surface. But I think at where we are practically in our walk with the Lord, I think this will offer us some help. Um, I've, I've listed four quadrants, four points of um, what I believe is called, the, really it's a fourfold purpose of preaching the gospel. And I believe when we are running on four cylinders here, I believe when we embody these four points, that I believe that there is an activation. And I believe that we are running on four cylinders. And I believe these embody what it means to have a heart set on fire. And I think it's very difficult, very difficult to go out into the world and to be able to function properly if you're not running on all four cylinders. I think there's a lot of things and a lot of neglect today where we want to do things without doing this and then we wonder why for whatever reason. Uh, maybe our families are out of order, our ministries are out of order. There's something that's just not right. And I believe it always go, goes back to where the scriptures would tell us how to properly put our lives together when it comes to the whole view of taking the gospel to the world from the local church. And the first point is the glory of God. The second point is man's only answer. The third point is the local church. And the third point is the health of the believer, him or herself. So let us start with the first point, the glory of God. Dealing with our motives. Dealing with the starting place of what it is that fuels our preaching. Fuels our behavior. Fuels our conduct. Wherever we are. Whether we're in the kitchen doing dishes. Or whether we're changing diapers. I got calluses in my hands for like 15 years of diaper changing. But it's being able to demonstrate the power of God in our lives wherever we are. But especially if you are men who are called out into the public square. There are things you're going to need to get in order. In order to run and move and preach the way God has originally intended and ordained in his word. And the first point is the glory of God. It's our view of God. Our love of God, as Calvin said, is this burning, this burning heart that God had redeemed him and given him. Is this redemption, and we see it in the light of God's glory. We just don't reduce it or minimize it down to some little recipe. But it's a reality of our whole entire experience of life. It embodies our whole entire life. For me to live as Christ, to die is gain. And the original word, the original language is, is for me to die, for me to die, Christ. For me to live, Christ is how it's originally written. It means it embodies our whole, encapsulates our whole being, our whole lives. Everything that we do is caught up in the glory of God. Uh, the Westminster Catechism says it this way: that the chief end of man, the chief end of man, is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. See, when we truly are glorifying God and putting God first and above all things, there is a joy that the world cannot take from us, that the world tries to artificially reproduce. 
There's counterfeits all over the place that would promise you um, a better life if you would just turn away from God and or put these things along with your Christianity. But the reality is, is that when we truly are in that place of glorifying God from a place of the redeemed, we see very clearly that there's a joy there even in death. If God were to take our lives, if you were to, for whatever reason, have a gun put to your head, that it wouldn't steal your joy. It's not just walking around all happy and positive all the time. It's, it's having a joy that cannot be taken away from you. I was reading the scriptures today, and it was talking about, the psalmist was talking about the waves of God coming upon him. These waves, you know, when, 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 when sometimes tragedy hits you, or something hits you unexpectedly, it's almost like... It just takes the wind right out of you. It's just like there's these roaring waves going through you. And that's the best way I can describe it. And I've been there before. And in prayer today, I was looking over these things. And, and I and I seen that he's talking about the wave. God, those waves are coming over me. And it, it's, it, it, when, we are, when we are held captive by with the joy of the Lord, we can endure these. We can endure any tempest, any waves that come our way. God is able to keep us. Keep us strong and, and keep us moving forward and, and, and keep us where we need to be. The glory of God is a silver thread which must run through all of our actions. 1 Peter 4.11 says that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. It's demolishing the whole sacred and secular lie that's out there that this is secular and this is sacred. It broke those boundaries. Very similar that began uh, the combustible movement of the Reformation when men and women realized that what they did outside of the mother church was equally as important as what was going on within, inside of the church. That their jobs, God cared about their jobs. God gave these men and women skills and talents and abilities to use for his glory. And they realized that God cared about those things. And God used those things. And that changed everything. And that's where the Reformation took off because there was no division there. It wasn't to say, well, what you're doing is meaningless. Your job is meaningless. You know, being in the house... As a, as, a, as a mom who's in the house with her children all day. That's not meaningless. Your job and going to work on Monday morning. That's not meaningless. See, all these things were to do under the glory of God. God has put these things into your life as a way and a means to glorify him and to shape and to mold us. A portion of his sanctification that he allows into our life to change us and to transform us more into the image of his son. But if we think that the only time anything's ever sanctified or holy is when someone's preaching or in the pulpit or singing songs, well, why not just stay here in here 24-7? Why even leave the building if this is the only thing that we do that's holy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when people get a hold of the reality, and, our, and listen, folks, in our country, we're very Pelagian. We're very secular, sacred-minded. We really are. And I think a lot of what you're seeing today in our culture is coming from that. People just think that there's no meaning in what I do unless I become a pastor or a missionary or get hired on staff at a church somewhere. That's a lie. That's false. Because God cares just as much as, much about as what you do in your profession, what God's given you to do, as he does what I'm doing right now. That's right. Believe that. Because you get a hold of that and you realize that, listen, the little things that you do in the mundane where no one sees, those little moments where you just feel like you're not going to make it anymore, and you feel dreary and crusty and dry. And you feel like you're going to drop over dead any moment. you got to continue to look at these walls in this house anymore. Hear the kids complain one more time or cry one more time. You know, I've heard it before and I know all about that. But listen, it's in those mundane moments. It's in those moments that I believe that God sees our greatest faith. It's preaching on the streets easy. Going out into the world and preaching, that's the easy part. The hard part is being a man of God in the home. And the mundane, the things that nobody sees, not going to see on YouTube. You know, they're not going to see you and hear you in the church and have this opportunity to be seen. It's where nobody sees and really nobody cares, but God does. You got to see the 50 million diapers you're changing. You know, I come home and feel like a hero of the cross. My wife goes, can you change the baby's diaper, please? You know, she just brings you right back down to reality. 
Because in, 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 the, in, in the real world, as a believer, there's a lot more than just preaching behind the pulpit and preaching out on the street. We have our whole lives that God encapsulates for the glory of God. Psalms 96.3 says, Declare His glory among the heathen. His wonders among all people. And I believe His glory can be declared in all realms of life. Do you know... Um, Robert Murray McChain's greatest quote says a, a holy minister in the, is an awful weapon in the hand of God. A holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of God. You know, that's true, but you know what? I don't think it's all the way true because I think a holy family Amen. is much more awful, much more devastating in the hand of God. I've seen our family do more work gospel-minded and seeing more life changed through being a godly family because you know you can't fake that, that that's an area in life where you can't pretend you can't fake i can't fake my relationship with my wife in front of others i can't fake that i can't fake my relationship with my children when we have company over or when i'm in church people see it and they're declaring the glory of god to the heathen his wonders to the world and there are times when I'm out on the street and I'm preaching my guts out and nothing's happening. And then our family goes and does something with another couple somewhere else. And God uses that instrument and that means to really change lives. So be encouraged today. You don't have to be a street preacher. You don't have to go out on Saturday nights with the preachers and follow them around and hand out tracts. You don't have to do that. But what you need to be focused on is that you're doing everything unto the glory of God everything that you do in this life do it under the glory of God otherwise you're going to fall into the trap and you're going to start thinking certain things are more holy and you're going to start getting depressed and feel useless like your life is no good because you're not out on Saturday night doing what these guys are doing you haven't handed out tracks like you should but you know being a godly mom Amen. And, and running a household and training your children up in the admonition of the Lord do you know how much that pleases the Lord Amen. do you understand that do you understand that you're nurturing these little souls you're taking them to the celestial city. I mean, man, that, that's a work that I'm telling you is the hardest work of all. Jesus reinstates the gospel command in Mark 16, 15, when he says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, not just to some, not just to Fort Worth, but to every creature. How do we do this? Is, is, would, would that mean your children? I mean, every creature. Does that mean the people within your congregation? It, mean, it means all people. We're to declare the gospel. Obviously, it's a message for the lost. It's the great commission of bringing people into the family of God. But we must understand that it goes; its application goes beyond just that. We've got to realize that we need gospel-powered <laughs> marriages, gospel-powered husbands, gospel-powered children, gospel-powered churches. These are all gospel-powered entities that God has given us to glorify his name. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 tells us what the glory of God is to be declared. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ is the manifestation of the glory of God. What greater glory is there? It's manifested humanly in Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians one twenty one says, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The pleasure of God. It pleases God when we do all things to the glory of God. It's pleasurable. You bring pleasure to God. How do we bring pleasure to God? By giving Him glory. Glorifying His Son in all areas of life. We understand this where you're not going to look at things the same way ever again. I'm telling you, it's very combustible and very reformational. People get a hold of this. They start thinking differently about life and their worldview changes. The nation changes. Preaching is worship. I want to compartmentalize this just a little bit now for those of us who do go out and proclaim the word of God like to deal with this a little bit for those of us who vocally proclaim the God, proclaim the gospel to people in the open air or vocalizing, doing one-on-ones or whatever we're doing. Um, preaching is worship. 
And we must see preaching the gospel as a sacred act of worship to Almighty God. You see, if we look at um, proclaiming the gospel as a sacred act of worship, we won't be so flippant when we go out and proclaim it. We understand who Christ is. We understand the gospel. And we understand the great responsibility and the great accountability that we have. We're not going to treat it as a light thing. They say this was one of the reasons that the great plagues, the great fires came upon London, I believe in the 1600s. It was taking God's word lightly and flippantly. And also they were mocking the preachers of that day. Apparently, according to the author, this is what began God's judgment upon those cities. So what you do is not a light thing. It's not a flippant thing. You're not just going out there sharing the gospel or going out there with some little recipe and coming home for the night. You are literally heralding our king. You're heralding the king's message to a lost world. A vile sinner who's been saved by the grace of God. You have got this great responsibility, this great mandate to take his gospel. God would use me to take his son to the world. That God's Holy Spirit would move through an imperfect human being. And that may be why a lot of us feel so rotten when we get done preaching and going out in the streets because the Spirit of God moves through imperfection. He uses our sinful tongues and our sinful lips to his glory. And it moves through us. And then we wonder why we feel so on tilt when we're done preaching. I think we should. I think at some points we should be the most disturbed people on the planet. Be disturbed at what's going on around us. Take it upon us the pathos of God, the feelings of God, the emotions of God, the thoughts of God. And going out into this world and proclaiming God in truth. Not just looking for decisions. What is that? You're out there as an artist painting our God to a lost world. You have an opportunity to describe and define who the God that we profess to follow. You are able to handle our beautiful Savior's message and proclaim him to the world. You understand what a great responsibility that is? Do you understand that? Because until we understand that, our message is going to sound, we're going to sound like thugs, street thugs. Pushing people around, being abusive, being jerks out there. We realize that such were some of us, where we came from, and what God has saved us from. And seeing the glory and preciousness of our Savior, seeing him high and lifted up, and having been come undone, the way we bring it to the world is going to be beautiful and precious, strong and violent and convicting and confronting. Absolutely. But it's going to be worship. It's going to be worship to our Lord. And God's going to use that to bring his elect in and save people and move people and change the culture and eventually change our nation. I believe that. Dr. C. Matthew McMahon of the Puritan Mind, he has a Puritan Mind Ministries. In his article, he wrote on preaching is worship. This is what he says. And this is interesting. So please listen to this. This is really amazing. <clears throat> I even got a hold of him and asked him, I said, can I use this in my sermons? Because this is just so powerful. I said, sure. And he says this, in the act, okay, in the act of the preaching, this glorifying of Christ is the essence of his worship, though at the same time, his gospel preaching ministers to needful people. Now he goes on to say, it is here that the preacher's feet bring good news of the gospel of peace. And while he is doing this, he acts as God's divinely appointed herald, reflecting the image of Christ as the living word in the message he brings. The preacher, listen, the preacher ought to be exceedingly gripped with a sense that he is delivering Christ to the people through his preaching. If he is enthralled with a sense of this, then he is immediately conscious of the nearness of God. That puts, makes the hairs of my arms stand up when I say that. Conscious awareness of the nearness of God when you preach. This worship 
and the nearness of God in what you're doing will make you behave right. And your conduct will glorify God. Let me move on. He says, this nearness and mode that the preacher travels through is the exact definition that God himself gives those who worship. I will be sanctified by those that draw near to me. Leviticus 10.3. And he says, whether that be the priest of the Old Testament or the preacher of the New Testament, worships God as he performs the duties God requires of him. And this would be true for any Christian in the outworking of their gifts. Then he goes on to say, preaching is worship. It is the vehicle that draws the minister closer to God during that hour. Preaching is a spiritual infection which ought to impregnate, impregnate the hearer with the life of God and Christ. If the preacher is intimately aware that he is doing this through the unction and temperance of the spirit of truth, he is immediately aware that God is delighted in the work that is being dealt with. For it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. It all makes sense. I mean, that hit me like a ton of bricks. I realized that it changed my whole course of preaching. Changed everything. Everything. The way, I, the way I did everything. The way I thought. The way I think. The way I think of other people when I'm preaching. The message that I'm preaching. It humbles me. It humbles me to think that God would use me. And that in this time of preaching, whether it be indoors or outdoors, like what Paul Washer said, there, there's no difference in the, what God holds us accountable to, whether the pulpit being indoors or outdoors. God sees it at the same level of preaching. It's that moment, guys, where we enter in to the nearness of God. And you better behave and you better fear the Lord. Because you're carrying a message and you better have that message right. The pulpit. Let's talk about that for a second. Is the pulpit important? Yes, it is. Does the Bible say anything about a pulpit? Because Charles Spurgeon, in the church he ministered at Park Street, had a wooden pulpit. But the Metropolitan Tabernacle, he had no pulpit. Does this mean that in one place he is a minister preaching the gospel, worshipped, and in another he did not? Certainly not. The absence or appearance of a physical pulpit does not determine whether, whether a preacher is worshipping or not. Isn't that amazing? I mean, doesn't that grab you and grip you? I mean, gentlemen, doesn't that get you excited to, to realize that, that this, is, this whole mode... This agency, as J.C. Ryle says, that changed nations, public proclamation, open-air preaching, this agency is a mode in which you draw near to the nearness of God. Yes, we're in the presence of God, but when you're actually doing this act, when you're acting this way, God is drawing near. It should cause us, it should cause us to fear God and think about what we're doing and what we're saying and how we're behaving in the world around us. Mm -hmm. William Farrell. Anybody familiar with William Farrell? He was the John the Baptist of John Calvin. He was the one that went through and just tore everything to pieces. They say he won all of Geneva to Christ through open-air preaching. He was a madman. He was intense. This is what it said about him. It said, um, he turned every stump and stone into a pulpit. Every house, street, and marketplace into a church. Provoked the wrath of monks, priests, and bigoted women. Was abused, called a heretic and a devil. Insulted, spit upon, and more than once more than once threatened with death. Wherever he went, he stirred up all the forces of the people and made them take sides for or against this new gospel. Which wasn't new at all, but he was contending against Roman Catholicism. Philip Chap also writes, No one could hear his thunder without trembling. Or listen to his most fervent prayers without being almost carried up to heaven. George Whitfield said this. He says, After I finished preaching in the open air, I was so overpowered by God's love that it almost took my life away. Tell me that ain't worship. I was so overpowered by the love of God while I was preaching in the open air that it almost took my life away. Wow. Get a hold of that. When you go out and you proclaim the word of God, let it be that for you. Preach the word that almost takes your life away. What happened to Josh? He died on the sidewalk up there. He was preaching the word of God and God just took him away. That's the way we should be and that's the way we should act. 
as preachers of the gospel. Number two, the second point. I'll try to move through these quickly. The second point is the only remedy for humanity. Just know this for sure, that you have the only remedy for humanity. Amen. Don't be fooled and think that education is the answer. Education is great, but it doesn't save. The educational system isn't going to make you into a new creature. Only Christ and only the gospel wielded. It's the power of God and the salvation. It's there. There's no other way. There's no other way. You can do good works. You can, you can do all these good works and never uh, get any trouble from anybody else. No adversity, no obstacles, whatever. If you, just, if you just live your life and you do good works for people, that's wonderful. We should do good works. But the moment you stand up in our apostate, perverted, arrogant culture and you say Christ is the only way to God, watch out for the piece of dead cat flying at you. Believe me, that moment you are now singled out and you are an enemy of the enemy. You are now a threat to the enemy. The moment you speak up that Christ is the only way, you're a target. But also the message you bring is the one that saves and brings men out of the jaws of hell into the kingdom of God. Just remember, say, listen. I don't have all this philosophy and all this stuff memorized and all these apologetics and all this. Listen, know the gospel. Know Jesus Christ. Have communion. I promise you, have communion with God. Love him. Serve him. Spend time with him. Just pray over the word of God. I know Whitfield used to pray over his Bible and Matthew Henry's commentary for hours. And that's how God would give him his sermons and his messages in the open air. It's this communion with God that breaks men's hearts. It's this act of worship that crushes men and women and brings them to our Savior. It's not all the philosophy because we compensate. When, we, when, when we're not doing these things, when we're not seeking the Lord, when we're not on our faces before God, when we're not doing these things, what are we doing? What are we doing with our time? Because we're using our time in front of watching YouTube preachers and idolizing men and listening to Christian rap music to get us stirred up before we go out on the streets. The compensation. If you're communion with God, you're never going to have, you're never going to be without words for a lost person. You know him, they know it, because there's authority. Authority in your preaching and in your speaking. There's authority there. You can tell when a man or a woman's got authority. I don't mean that in a way of missing out on the way that God has ordered the family. I don't mean it that way. I'm talking about you can tell they know Jesus Christ. You can tell when someone knows the Lord. Let us move on. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, for no one comes to the Father except through me. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Matthew 16.18, Jesus said, Upon this rock, no other rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We're a prevailing church, not a failing church. We're not a defeated church. We're a church victorious. We've got to remember that. Christ won when he rose from the dead. Amen. And he rules and he reigns. He is the king of kings. And he's a king now. He's a ruling, reigning king. The third point. The church. And obviously these points probably could go on forever if a person really wanted to dig into them. And once again, I'm just kind of scratching the surface on these. But I think it's just important dealing with the church, uh, the local church, and how God sees the church, and how he died for the church, and the local church, the gathering of believers. And in Ephesians 4, 11, 12, it says, He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors, teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And I can tell you this today, that having an evangelistic presence in your church is the greatest way to grow a church. Not just grow it by numbers, but to mature it. Because it perfects it. It sets it like you set a bone. It brings health to the body. Because you know what? That's what we're supposed to be doing. Spurgeon said it best. We're to love God and win souls. That is what we are as the church of Jesus Christ. That's our one duty. is to win souls. And if we're not doing that, if we suppress that, then we're like, we're reduced to all kinds of crazy things. 
It's like having the fire of God upon you, but yet not doing anything with it. It will come out ugly in other areas of your life if you suppress that. Be a soul winner. Be a soul winner. John Calvin understood from the word of God the dignity of a true church of Christ and the seriousness of separating from it. He says no one is permitted to spurn it, the true church he's talking about, and its authority. Flout its warnings, resist its counsels, or make light of its chastisements, much less to desert it and break its unity. For the Lord esteems the communion of his church so highly that he counts it as a traitor and apostate from Christianity anyone who arrogantly leaves any Christian society, provided it cherishes the true ministry of the word and sacraments. He so esteems the authority of the church that when it is violated, he believes his own diminished. From this it follows that separation from the church is the denial of God and Christ. Hence, we must even more avoid so wicked of a separation. For when with all our might we are attempting to overthrow the overthrow of God's truth, we deserve to have him hurl the whole thunderbolt of his wrath to crush us. Calvin also states that no one escapes the just penalty of this unholy separation from the true church without bewitching himself with the personal errors and foulest delusions. How true this is. Isn't that amazing? Be serious about the local church and where God has brought you. Uh, esteem it. Fear God. Get into the local church. Submit to your elders. Be accountable for what you do. Love the people of God, serve the people of God, and grow with the people of God. And the fourth and last point, the believer. The believer. What the kickback is on your own life when you're activated in your faith. 2 Timothy 4, 5 says, Paul talking to Timothy, he says, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. And this, I believe, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, is the transforming principle in becoming more like Christ. I believe that. I believe when we are activated and winning <laughs> souls, I believe it fulfills our ministry and duties in life. And when you take that out of your life, in any realm, in any place, things start to dry up and grow cold, and you find yourself feeling a little bit closed out of the things of God, the will of God. It's hard to win souls. It's hard to talk to people. It is. It's a challenge. It's fearful. I still get fearful. I still get scared when I go out and do things. It's still there. But we must overcome our fear with courage and trust God and go and do it anyways. We must speak up anyways regardless in spite of our fear. Many of the problems that we face today in the church are directly linked with our disobedience to the great commission. Something happens when we confess Christ before the eyes of the unbelieving world and before whose eyes are engaged from heaven. The soul draws near to God during the proclamation of God's word and one leaves permanently transformed under the influence and power of the Holy Spirit. This is why we need Jeremiah's today to rise up. We need men of God to rise up under this infusion of this spirit moving you in power today. The sacred fire of God in our preaching. History is filled with those who, whose hearts whose hearts burned for Christ. We see, we, we need the fire that started in Jerusalem and spread throughout the nations with St. Mark in the deserts of Egypt to the rivers of Gaul with St. Martin down through Ireland with St. Patrick to the shores of Scotland that were suppressed for almost a thousand years and out of nowhere this combustible saint comes up on the field. One of them was discipled by Martin Luther. His name was Patrick Hamilton and he was the first Scottish martyr. And we see this lineage come. We see that he went and he studied under Martin Luther. And he brought these great doctrines back to his nation and began to preach them. Very quickly under his preaching, he offended many. He offended many because what he was coming against was the whole entire papacy. And when he came into a nation that's just covered and inundated and intoxicated with idols, and he's coming with the gospel of grace that he was discipled with by Martin Luther... He comes from Luther and he comes right into his nation and he begins to preach. And the message is so offensive that they burn him at the stake. It says that Hamilton's youth and nobility and gracious bearing had a strong influence so that after he was burned, one witness put it this way, 
that the smoke or the reek of Patrick Hamilton infected all on who it did blow. It affected one young man who came into the picture, who took upon the torch, the fiery torch, who had a burning heart for God, who rose upon the scene, and his name was George Wishart. And he took upon the fiery torch of God that was handed to him from Patrick Hamilton, and he kept the fire burning. And he began to go through the cities. It was said he was preaching in the open air, and hundreds would gather and just listen to him for hours. In a complete fallen nation under the judgment of God, a completely apostate nation, God was raising up open air preachers to come into this infected, this sin infected nation with the word of God. And here we see the reek of Patrick Hamilton falling upon one individual who rises up and is so dangerous. Let me just tell you, dangerous people have dangerous friends in a good way. They have dangerous friends. And he had a dangerous doctrine. It was the gospel of grace. In a, in, a, in a Pharisaic world. And he preached his guts out. But his message was so threatening and so dangerous, he needed bodyguards. He was surrounded by men. And one of his best bodyguards, the most fearless one of all, carried a two-handed sword, a Scottish claymore. And when Wisher would stand up and begin to preach in the open air, his bodyguard would stand up with a two-handed sword and just say, go ahead and make your move. Because he was a bodyguard, and he was watching Wishart's back. And he was a disciple of Wishart. And he would hold off the mobs trying to take him out because the message that he was preaching was having such an effect on the people that the, that the world was starting to turn to the Lord. This guy was dangerous and powerful and used by God. And he was going after with a heart set on fire and so much on fire that he needed bodyguards and men carrying swords. And this night, Wisher knew was coming to an end. Young man, 25 years old, looked at his head bodyguard and said, listen, God requires one sacrifice. He knew he was going to burn at the stake. He knew it. And certainly they dragged Wisher off and they burned him at the stake. And it says that the mantle of these two fiery hearts fell upon his bodyguard fell upon one man and that bodyguard is none other than John Knox John Knox laid down the sword of man and took up the sword of God Hamilton the place he came from was sacked by the French he was taken upon a galley ship I believe it was for a year and a half okay here he is on a galley ship okay you just become a convert okay you just see your best friend burned at the stake you grab the word of God. You're called by God. Next thing you know, you're sacked. Now you're on a galley ship for a year and a half. It doesn't make sense, God. I thought you are calling me to this ministry. Now I'm on a galley ship, chained. I can't understand anybody around me because they all speak in French. But in God's providence, you know what happened? All these men spoke in French for the right amount of time where <laughs> Knox had actually learned their language so he could go to Geneva and talk to one of his buddies named John Kelvin and understand what he was teaching and bring it back to Scotland to bring the Reformation. Mm. Tell me that is the providence of God. Mm. that amazing? And God set this man on fire. And God used him for the great Reformation. And I guess it was, it was the um, Queen of England said she was more fearful of the prayers of John Knox than all of the armies of England. She's terrified of him. He backed her up in her own castle in the corner of her own room and condemned her idols. And they never killed him. You know where you find John Knox today? I've been in Scotland, lived there for two years. You know where you find him? You see these beautiful monuments in, in, in the uh, cemeteries, right? These huge monuments where people go and they're like, oh, this is where John Knox is buried. No, it's not. You know where they buried him? There's a little X in a parking lot out in the middle of nowhere, and that's where he's buried. A little X on the pavement. That's his gravestone. An X. That's, what, that's the remains of our reformer. It's not this grand, grand statue. His real grave is nothing more than an axe in some abandoned parking lot. John Knox is noted, and I'm finishing here. John Knox is noted for saying these words. He feared no man. He said, spare no 
arrows. Spare no arrows. Shoot them all. Use those arrows. Spare none. When I was a young man, um, back in the day, I was really involved in bow hunting. It was a great, it was something that really pacified my time. I had just a great satisfaction with climbing up in a tree and shooting at things with my bow and arrow. I was absolutely fascinated with it, so much so that I studied the art of it and understood the dynamics of it. And you always have a buddy that does the same thing. And we're both up to our neck in bow hunting. We love bow hunting. We've studied bow hunting. We realize that, you know, uh, there's a certain way to kill the deer. And if you want the, if you want the deer, you got to go shoot for the vitals. And uh, come to realize that uh, if you shoot a deer in the heart, through the heart, the arrow will pass through the deer completely. Um, so we had, we had went out into our wood, out into the woods. And um, we'd been hunting for a while, but we hadn't gotten anything. And I was in my tree stand, and he was in his. And it was getting just before dark. And next thing I heard this loud crash. I thought he fell out of the tree. So I he climbed down and run over there and he's all hysterical. I go, what's wrong? He's like, I got a deer, I shot a deer, I just shot a deer. And he's just going out of his mind, right? And I'm getting excited. I said, really, where, where did you see it? Where did you shoot it? I wanna know everything. Because when we go to the store and buy our, our instruments, we got the best stuff. I had this short brush bow. Back then it was cool. And overdraw, graphite little arrows with Copeland twister tips so I made all like the best things that money could buy right so you could do the most damage on the victim that comes by your tree stand right so I'm saying man what happened he goes I hit the deer right over there and it took off over there so I go walking over there and I look down on the crown and guess what I find his arrow and part inside me a little bit of me I was kind of happy I thought he missed it so he couldn't brag about it right and I reached out and picked up the arrow and I got to looking at the arrow I said brother I said, you, you, you missed, you missed. And he comes up to me, he goes, no, 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 I didn't miss. And it's getting dark, we took our flashes, we looked at the arrow, we looked on the arrow, and there was blood on the arrow. He says, brother, I didn't miss. He said, the arrow went clean through that deer, the deer didn't even feel it, and bolted off that way. And, and if our calculations are right, we're gonna find that deer 70 yards up the path, dead. Brother, I had a vital shot, it went right through. Okay, so we began to wander up the path, and sure enough, there was that deer. He said, brother, when I hit him with that bow, the arrow was so sharp, the deer didn't even move until it went completely through him. Then it jumped and took off. It didn't even know it was hit until it got 70 yards up the path and fell over dead. Didn't even realize it. People tell me all the time when I'm out on the street, you know, people walking by, what you're doing is not working. You keep on preaching, people are walking by, they're not listening, you know, should you be doing it a different way and this way? And, but the scriptures tell me here in Isaiah 49 too, it says, He hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me. And Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intent of the heart. What does God say today? His word is so sharp at times that when you're preaching, the people that hear it can't even feel it. Do they get 70 yards up the road and fall over dead before the altar of a blood-stained cross? You're firing and sparing no arrows. You don't know exactly what's going to happen. You can have three or four passing through shots. And they get home to their hotel rooms or go back to their families or back to their offices. And they start to bleed out. And then they fall over dead at the altar and come alive to Christ. This is what we do when we preach the gospel. When you vocalize the gospel to your neighbors or anybody else, remember that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Remember that. You're firing arrows that are so sharp, a lot of times the human soul can't even feel it, that it passes through so fast. Through the vitals, by the way. So make sure you're preaching the right gospel because you want to make sure you're hitting the vitals. Amen. Now I'm going to finish with this story, and then we'll close in prayer, sir. Speaking of the heart, I want to finish with the story and tell you a small, quick story about the story of the heart of a king. This is the story of the black Douglas. To his friends and his family, he was known as the good James. The good James. To his buddies, he was known as good James Douglas. 
But to the English, to his enemies, he was known as the Black Douglas. One of the most feared Scottish patriots of all time during the Scottish Wars of Independence. One of the most feared men. At the age of 10, his father, William Douglas, was imprisoned and his land was confiscated and his father was eventually killed and his inheritance given to another. Oppression loomed and slavery was ever present. William Douglas' dad ran around with William Wallace in the Scottish Wars, the beginning of the Wars of Independence. He was imprisoned and then killed and then all of the inheritance for his family was removed and given to the English. Young James was put into the care of those who now, because he was fatherless, who taught him the word of God and to fight. He became an expert in warfare and developed such a keen sense of the heart of God and to his earthly king, who was known as King Robert the Bruce. He fought so brilliantly and magnificently on the field of battle that he was the first to be knighted high knight and the first lieutenant on the field of battle. He was known to be quite a jolly and somewhat of a shy man around his friends. But before his entrance upon the battlefield, it was said that his whole countenance would change. Before he entered into battle, you know, he was shy and everyone knew him as kind of this laughable guy. But just before he entered the battlefield, his whole countenance would change into a war countenance because he knew what he was fighting for. He, become, he, he would become charged with the thoughts of freedom and regaining the inheritance of his father's back. He became infumed and overtaken with the desire to see his people and king once again have dominion over their land. In 1314, he won a major battle with Robert the Bruce and set Scotland free. It was the Battle of Bannockburn. And there their glorious triumph was so magnificent. that Douglas's fame went out through history. He was so feared that the English moms, when they're trying to keep their babies quiet, they say, hush, little baby, or the black Douglas is going to get you. And it, that's what they would use because they thought he was the ghost of his father. Because he would come out of nowhere with 20 men and wipe out whole battalions of the English. He would just show up out of the middle of nowhere. They thought he was the ghost of his father. That's how good he was at guerrilla warfare. How dangerous he was. So dangerous, he became the best friend of King Robert the Bruce. And as the king lay there on bed, he was dying. He was dying. And he said, I want James to come in here. He looked at James and said, will you take my heart? And he always wanted to say, will you bury it in Jerusalem? Will you take it to the Holy Land and bury it there in the Holy Land? And James stepped back and he was in awe that he would even be asked to do this great deed. And he took it upon himself. So they took the heart out of Robert the Bruce. They embalmed it. And they put it in a golden casket with a chain over his neck. He went off to the Holy Lands. And the Moors there, the Muslims, were there fighting. So he joined with another campaign of those that lived over there. And he fought in this battle. And on his way of completing his mission of bringing the king's heart to the Holy Land... The battle got so ferocious at one point, he looked back and he saw one of his friends who was caught in the turmoil of this battle and he was alone. So there, the black Douglas, or James Douglas, thought to himself, okay, I've got a mission from the king, but yet my buddy's over there and there's no way he's going to get out of that mess. So he went up into the round of the crowd and history says that he took off the chain he took off the heart of his king and he held it up and he said, ever before me, brave heart, wherever you go, I will follow. And he threw the golden, he threw the heart of his king into the enemy and he went in there and fought and was killed. Later on, when his body was found, there was his friend and there was his body laying there in the sand. And when they rolled his body over, there was the heart of his king. There was the heart of his king. He finished the mission all right. And that question must be asked to us today. Are you willing to take the heart, the fiery heart of our king, behind enemy lines? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do that?
because this is where you're at now. This is the turning point of many of your lives. Are you willing to take the heart and say to the Lord, ever before me, brave heart, wherever you go, I will follow. Let us pray. Father, I thank you so much, Lord, for what you've done here today. And I pray, Father, that, God, I wasn't too long, Lord, but I pray that your word went out. And I pray that your people were encouraged. Be glorified today. Be glorified today in this body, Lord. I thank you from the depth of my heart for allowing me to come, Lord. I ask you to reciprocate a blessing upon these people here, my family here, the people of God. Use them mightily, Lord God. For your glory, Lord God, let them take the heart, your heart, your fiery heart, Lord God, behind enemy lines. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.